What is God actually doing behind the scenes when someone commits moral evil, or what we typically refer to as sin? In Romans chapter 3, Paul makes a startling statement that God can produce good even through human evil. So even sin can serve the purposes of God. But the question becomes, how? What does this even mean? And does this mean that sin is now acceptable because God can use it for good? Let's jump into God's word to find out. Romans chapter 3 verse 1, it says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Seems like we're starting off in the middle of a conversation that we have no right to intrude on. So let's back up to understand the context of what it is that Paul's talking about. When you read the Bible, make sense of what you're reading by understanding the context. What that really means is understand the main point of what came before it so you can begin to understand how the author, Paul here, is going to start to implement the previous main points into his arguments in this current passage. And so Paul has talked about how, look, a true child of God, someone who is truly a part of God's family. He refers to them as a Jew. A Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. Okay, so what we see here is that Paul is addressing the fact that physical circumcision, as much as a Jewish person would find identity and security and confidence in their physical outward marking, he's saying, actually, Uh, Someone who is truly the people of God has been circumcised by the Spirit in their heart, and that's not something the letter of the law can do. Therefore, their praise is not from man, but from God who actually does the act of spiritual circumcision, which is just to take away the heart of stone and to give a heart of flesh. And now we find in chapter 3, as Paul has been unpacking why Israel should have no national ethnic pride in their descent from Abraham, as if that's what gets me into heaven, Paul's going to continue to unpack in chapter 3 this continuing argument. He says, then what advantage has the Jew? Right. What is the value of circumcision? Because, you know, I'm going to highlight anything that relates to the nation of Israel. Okay. Their physical circumcision that came from the Abrahamic covenant, their Jewish descent, specifically in this, you know, addressing the fact that these Israelites descended from Judah. And he says, uh, much in every way to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So when we're talking about those who are a part of the nation of Israel, their unique benefits Um, of physical circumcision and the Abrahamic covenant and the oracles of God, that being the Torah and the laws of God, all these different things and having that entrusted to them. Okay. Paul's argument is going to include questioning things like, so what advantage do they have? Does circumcision matter? Uh, You know, and he goes, well, they were entrusted the oracles of God. So that's a good starting place. So he says to begin with, not, in other words, this is not going to be his full argumentation. This is just the starting point. Well, let's start in the beginning. Let's start with what matters uh, as it relates to the things of salvation. The oracles of God were entrusted to the nation of Israel through Moses. Okay. So what if some were unfaithful? Notice the continuing questioning on the part of Paul, where he's asking these questions that he's also going to answer to almost get into the mind and the shoes of his audience who might be asking these things. So, yeah, okay, you're saying that Israel has no spiritual eternal benefit from being physically circumcised. You're saying it doesn't matter, you know, that they have the letter of the law. It doesn't matter that they're outward Israelites when they stand before God on judgment day. That does them no good. So the questions Paul begins to answer is, okay, so what advantage do they have? And let's, you know, track with what Paul is doing here. I'm going to highlight this in blue and I'm just going to put a question mark here. What is the advantage to being a Jew? What is the, I'm going to highlight this in blue, the value of physical circumcision, right? And he goes much in every way and he connects circumcision and he connects being an Israelite to having the oracles of God. In other words, there's an entrusting here that is the main advantage and the main value of having that covenant with God through Abraham and the patriarchs is that these people are given the unique revelation of God, the specific revelation in the Torah, in the laws and commands that God gave the nation of Israel. That's an incredible responsibility and an honor, but he's not going to stop there. He is going to address the fact that that's an incredible privilege for a people to nationally have this unique revelation of God and all the things that accompany that. That's wonderful. But does that aid them in salvation? Paul will begin to answer these questions. What if some were unfaithful? 
those among the Jews who were physically circumcised had the oracles of God, what if some were unfaithful? That's the question. I'm going to highlight anything having to do with being faithless or unfaithful or disobedient, okay? What if they were unfaithful? That's the question. And when you see a line of questioning, when an author asks several questions in a row, it's on you to maybe think about what do these questions have in common? Because the author or the speaker is not going to ask random questions that have nothing to do with each other. These questions are all going to be centrally focused around a main idea or a main topic, which will help us understand what is the main subject of this material. And then how does this relate to what was said previously? Okay. So think about the question about having an advantage, having ethnic descent from Abraham or the advantage of physical circumcision and that covenant or being entrusted with the oracles of God. And then what is the question here? What if some were unfaithful? What do these questions have in common? What are they focused around? Something to really meditate on. Well, if they were unfaithful, the question becomes, does circumcision or national Israelite identity, does that do them any good? Having the oracles of God, does it do them any good if they're unfaithful to the covenant and the oracles God gave them? Okay. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? So I'm going to highlight again, the unfaithfulness and the faithlessness of those who are, are given these unique benefits as the nation of Israel, which means that they can still prove to be unfaithful and without faith in the God who gave them these things and these covenants and this unique national identity as the people of God in the world. They can still choose to be rebellious and unbelieving towards this God, which you're already starting to see the argumentation for him being that having an Israelite you know, nationality and all these different things doesn't mean you're secure. Doesn't mean you're a part of the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean you have faith like Abraham did. And then the second question within this idea of unfaithfulness, Paul asks is, hey, does that nullify? I'm going to highlight an orange because we highlighted an orange, the oracles of God, which God gave, he entrusted, which means there's a degree of accountability and responsibility. He entrusted those things to Israel. I'm going to use orange to highlight the faithfulness of God. Just so you see that God is faithful to his word and the Torah that he gave to his people and the covenant found in that, that they made at Sinai when they entered into a covenantal contract, a somewhat of a marital contract with God, you might say. And also think about the faithfulness of God seen in the covenant he made through the circumcision, the mark he gave to Abraham. This, this becomes a question of if Israel was unfaithful with all their exclusive benefits, does it do them any good? Second question, does it nullify or void God's faithfulness towards his covenant people? And this is something that Paul will begin to unpack even more throughout the letter. By no means. So he does answer the question. He says, heck no. Make that very clear. If Israel was faithless, that doesn't mean God is faithless. It means they were faithless to him and he's still faithful to them. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this. He's about to, I'm going to scoot this up. He's about to use an Old Testament passage. I believe it's going to be in Psalm chapter 51. And he's going to quote from Psalm 51. And we're going to look at that passage. But for now, think about the argumentation, okay? God is true even if everyone else is a liar. So I'm going to circle, you know, highlight in yellow anything relating to Israel's unfaithfulness, their deception, their dishonesty, and God's truthfulness and faithfulness to his covenant. Because essentially Israel did say, we agree to the covenantal terms. And whether they actually believed they would hold to that or whether they knew they wouldn't is not, a, it's a whole, whole different conversation. But the point is they're framed up as even if they lied, He's still true. And this is the whole, almost like the, the letter to the Romans hinges on, if Israel failed, is God still faithful? Yeah, to his covenant people, the remnant. And that includes Gentiles too. So as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. The reason I squared this up is because anytime you read the Bible and pay attention to when you see, quote, pay attention to quotations, 
Usually that means a biblical author is quoting from somewhere else in scripture, usually the Old Testament, okay? So what we have here is an Old Testament quotation. So the reason I squared this up and drew an arrow here is because he's going to use this reference, uh, this quotation from Psalm 51, um, which I believe is Psalm 51. I might be wrong, but we'll check. We'll fact check me. Um, he's going to use this quotation to continue the uh, this argument that God is truthful even if everyone else who agreed to the covenantal terms lied and broke their end of the covenant, even if that's true. Let me prove to you with the Old Testament. So I'm going to bring you to Psalm chapter 51, and right here is the quotation that Paul uses from Psalm 51 verse 4. I was right, Psalm 51. At least I'm not stupid. <laughs> okay, Psalm 51. This is David uh, crying out for a clean heart, admitting his sin, where he slept with Bathsheba and killed her husband and all that. And he's confessing and repenting. And this is the psalm of, of sorrow and repentance and all that stuff. But Paul quotes this section right here. So when you see a quotation, specifically in the New Testament, it's most helpful to do this. This is the portion that Paul is actually quoting, okay? And whenever a biblical author quotes the Old Testament, he's using that uh, to further his argument or the point that he's making. So it's on me to, to ask, how does this fit into his argument that God is still faithful, even though other people might not be faithful to him? He maintains his truthfulness, his integrity, his honesty, okay, all that stuff. I want to think about how does this further Paul's argument? The second thing to consider is when you see a quotation from scripture, go to the original place where that's pulled from. So here it's Psalm 51. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I typically do uh, when a passage is quoted. I want to read that Old Testament passage in its original context, because usually what surrounds the quotation or what the quoted part, what surrounds that plays into the biblical author's argument. So for instance, he is quoting from this, but the biblical writers and authors are very uh, keen on what they're pulling from and what surrounds that text of scripture. Okay, so it says here, uh, David cries out, again, this is his sin, and he's admitting it, and he goes, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Okay, according to your abundant mercy. And what I want to do is, I'm not going to spend so much time on this because we got to get back to Romans 3 eventually, and we could maybe come here another day, but I'm going to highlight any key ideas that might play into Paul's argumentation. Uh, about Israel and God's faithfulness. Uh, David cries out for mercy from God, okay? He appeals to God's steadfast love and, once again, his abundant mercy. Because remember, David has transgressed and violated the law of God by killing a man, committing adultery, covering it up, all that stuff, and he's coming out. And he goes, blot out my transgressions. So, this is God mercifully out of his gracious love, wiping out David's sin. That doesn't mean there's no consequences, but to not condemn David, to not hold it against him, right? He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And so we see the idea of God is the one who cleanses and washes from sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So the, the focus seems to be on David's own moral failure, right? Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He says against you only. Well, hold on, David. You kind of killed a dude who was one of your mighty men. and You kind of slept with his wife, covered it up. What do you mean against you only, God, have I sinned? Well, he says mainly. God, as the ultimate judge who brings ultimate judgment, is the main opinion he's concerned with. You're the one that I've transgressed against. In other words, David gives us insight into what sin really is. Sin against other people, a violation of God's law, is always, always a direct, uh, you know, what's it called? Not attack on God, but it's directly against him. Though it might be you offending someone else and harming someone else, it is, a, it is against God. We need to learn how to see sin like that, and David sees it like that. He's done what is evil in your sight. So I want to think about mercy, God's love, God's cleansing and washing, and David's desire for that. I want to think about David's sin being covered, and I want to think about how David sees his own sin as being open and exposed um, in the sight of God. He sees it all. He says, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. In other words, he says, so that. 
This is why he says against you only have I sinned because God is blameless in his judgment and he's justified in his words. Whether that be in reference to the law that David has violated or the words that God will declare um, as judgment towards David. Um, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He goes, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So I just want to list out when I read an Old Testament passage and try and connect it back to where it was being quoted from um, or where it was being quoted. I want to think about the main ideas. I see sin as a very big uh, main subject here. He was brought forth in iniquity and sin. My mother conceived me. But here God delights in truth. God teaches wisdom in the secret heart. And that's going to ultimately play into David repenting and crying out for a clean heart. But you can go on and on and read the rest of Psalm 51. I just want to give you a, you know, the big picture of what Psalm 51 is saying so that we don't just take this soundbite, if you will, out of context and go, well, Paul was making this point. He was making a point with his passage, and we'll see what that is, but it involves everything else that surrounds it the forgiveness, the mercy, the love, God being true and blameless in his judgment, right? And David sinning mainly against God, who is the perfect judge and lawgiver. So now back in Romans chapter three, Paul says that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. In other words, this is God's uh, words and his truth prevailing. This is his judgment being ultimate and blameless and uh, completely accurate and righteous and just. His words and his judgment are what's in mind here. God is the one who is just, and he's the one who justifies. And we see actually David crying out for that and appealing to God's character when he cries out for God to wash him and cleanse him of sin. But the way Paul is using this quotation from Psalm 51 is very simply to make the point, God is true in all his judgments, in all his ways, they're inscrutable. He's perfect, he's righteous, he's just. Right, this Hebrews talks about the scepter of, of his throne as uprightness and justice. Even if everyone else proves to be a liar and violates the covenant and the words referring to either the Torah or the words of God's judgment, even so, regardless of what they're violating, regardless of what they're failing to do, God is still true, even if his people are a terrible representation of who he is. Even if his people don't hold to his covenant, he's still truthful to those who do hold to it. He's still truthful and honest to those who will be un- end up being the remnant within Israel who end up having faith. So let's keep going. So it says, if I can talk, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? And it's on me as a, as a Bible reader to go, when did we ever establish this as a fact that our unrighteousness serves, which you might say serves the purpose of God or serves to do this? Our unrighteousness shows the righteousness of God. It's as if Paul is using this as an established fact and going, well, you know, if I'm going to highlight uh, in what? Blue. We'll take blue to refer to the unrighteousness of the people. I know I used yellow earlier, but changing it up. And we'll use this to refer to the righteousness of God. Paul's just working with this as a matter of fact. Hey, our unrighteousness can serve to show the righteousness of God. Almost like it's a platform for God's righteousness to be seen. And what's the platform? Our unrighteousness. And he goes, if this is the case, what shall we say? I don't know what I would say. That God is a, he'll, he'll tell you what he means. That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us. And he'll go on in verse in you know, the rest of this verse to say, look, I'm speaking in a human way. In other words, he's talking like the fools who will accuse him of saying these things. And he'll talk about them. There are people who accuse Paul of saying that, well, we should just commit unrighteousness because it serves to show God's righteousness. And Paul's going to talk about them. But there's also people that believe this. They believe that if our evil, uh, is darkness and God's righteousness is is light, then the darker it is, the more bright his light shines, right? So how is God just to inflict wrath on us if we're just revealing how good he is by letting our darkness be all the more dark? That's the argumentation. 
And Paul uses this, you know, God is justified in all that he speaks, not just in Torah, but in his judgments, in what he declares about people who either, you know, hold to it or violate it. And he is the one who prevails when people try and judge him for his judgments, as if they're the judge. No, God's the judge. But the point here is, but, in other words, something about this passage or what was said earlier, and this is what I do when I read the Bible. If I come across an idea that's like, I must have missed that. Must have not been paying attention when I was reading. I'll backtrack a little bit to see if I see any evidence of this as if Paul's already established it as a fact. Because it's as if he is. He's talking to us like he actually said this already. And so if you go back, you can start to see where the idea starts to form. But let's continue. We're addressing God. Is he unrighteous to inflict what? Wrath? Why would you punish people for just magnifying your righteousness with their evil? That's the argumentation. And Paul's going to address that because people think like this and he's going to answer them. He's going to answer them. And he's also going to make it clear that he does not believe this or teach this. That's why he says in verse 6, By no means. How could God judge the world? Notice the repeating theme of God's judgment or God being judge, or God being judged by those who are actually the liars and those who violated the covenant, and they're accusing him of unrighteousness, right? Notice the theme of judgment. I just do that as a Bible reader. I'll notice, hey, not only do I notice repeating words and key ideas, but you know, even synonymous terms that are being used. I say, oh, almost, I see a lot of judgment or God being justified or other people accusing him and standing in the place of judge. I just want to take note of that because maybe that is a main point in what Paul is saying is the concept of judgment on both ends. People who try and judge God, but they're the unrighteous ones. And then God who judges both the unrighteous and righteous, and he's perfect in his judgments. How could God judge the world? Meaning, the whole world is what's in mind here. But earlier, when he was talking about, he's quoting Psalm 51, he's talking about the, the faithlessness of Israel. He was talking about just national Israel here. If they were unfaithful, right, and God remains faithful, and their unfaithfulness magnifies his faithfulness to the covenant, then why does he inflict wrath on them for doing that? If it serves a purpose, if sin serves a purpose and God's doing something behind the scenes to work good from evil, then why is evil being punished? Some people think like that. And Paul's going, look, if God can't even judge his own people properly, being the nation of Israel, how could he judge the whole world? So now Paul's going to start to bring in the Gentiles. He says, but if through my lie, God's truth abounds, which is a very similar idea to what he said in verse 5 about our unrighteousness serves a purpose, which is that our unrighteousness is like a platform for God's righteousness to be magnified. Like, look how dark I am. It makes him look all the brighter. He's using a very similar statement here in verse 7. So just pay attention to stuff like that, where you're like, I saw an idea earlier of darkness almost serving a purpose to magnify the light or make the light look brighter. And here we see the same thing. God's truth abounds to his glory. Through what? He says, through my light. Now, Paul's using a hypothetical scenario here. And he's also, you know, speaking on behalf of his adversaries who say these things about him. He goes, well, if through my light, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Which was the idea we saw earlier. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? And so I'm just going to pay attention to that. The, con the being condemned as a sinner here, right, is down in verse 5, God inflicting wrath. Same idea. It's punishment upon the sinner. Same idea. Why not do evil that good may come? If this is what God does, he's a master of working good out of evil. We'll highlight good in blue. And we'll highlight, again, human evil in orange. Why not just do evil so that good may come? Because God's going to work good through all things, right? We see this all throughout scripture. Joseph in the Old Testament being 
one of the greatest Old Testament pictures, and then Jesus being the ultimate picture of God working good through human evil. And this is actually a way that people think and even try to um, stand above God, atheists or what have you, philosophers that go, ah, I don't believe in God. If, if he's good, then why does he punish you know, the evil that actually is used to bring good? As some people slanderously charge us with saying. And Paul says their condemnation is just. Meaning the people who, and you go, who, who are the people? I don't want to be the people who are condemned, right? Well, it's the people slanderously charging Paul with saying this. Meaning, they're spreading this rumor that Paul is telling and teaching people, hey, do evil because God's going to work good through it, man. And Paul's going, no, I don't. And if you're slanderously spreading this about me, your condemnation is just. So don't just notice the fact that judgment and the theme of judging is used quite a bit in this little section, but also the idea of God's judgment looking like condemnation or wrath or being condemned as sinners, you know, for those who are unrighteous. God's judgments aren't just affirming what's right, but condemning what's wrong. That's how judgment works. And there has to be a standard and a measuring stick by which God makes the judgment call, right? Do you meet the standard or do you not? And Paul is this whole time saying, look, if you're going to rely on the law as some advantage in the sight of God, you, you misunderstand it. And he'll get into that in a little bit. In the next Bible study video, we'll look at the law. But for now, know that Paul is systematically helping the Jew understand that everything you've historically trusted in and thought, I'm good with God because I have circumcision and temple and law. He's going, none of that helps you. It doesn't save. It doesn't add to Christ. It doesn't give you an extra, you know, close spot in heaven to God. It doesn't do you any good because we'll see in chapter or the, the rest of this chapter in verse nine that everyone has sinned. So whether you're a Jew or Gentile, right? The whole point is God's going to judge the whole world, Jew and Gentile. And what is the basis of that judgment? If you're going to go by the law, you're going to fail that every time. No one's going to meet that perfectly. That's why faith will be introduced. And so the point here is that Paul actually works with the idea that, yes, God can work good even through human evil. And one of those goods that God can work is that his glory is actually, it abounds and his character is more magnified, his truth, his, his light, his radiance, you know, when the world is it's almost like the darkness of human evil uh, proves to validate the truthfulness of God's law. I know that sounds bizarre. And this is why Paul is addressing this now. Because there are people who will run with that and go, so we should have sinned then, right? And Paul's going, no, 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 you don't understand. God is good. And his truth abounds. In other words, human lies and darkness just serves a purpose in the sense that um, it's almost validating what God says in the law. David sinned in Psalm 51. And when he does, he goes, you know what, God? I've sinned against you. Well, how do you know that? Because the law of God actually tells you what sin is and what it is to obey God. And so for David to admit, I've sinned, is actually affirming what God says in his law is good or evil. So me doing wrong or you doing wrong it just lends credence to what God has said is good or bad in his word by me admitting this is sin or this is wrong. So that's why some people will say, why am I being condemned? Why does God inflict wrath? And Paul's going, in all his judgments, he's true, though everyone else be liar. Though everyone else break the covenant, he's going to be true and faithful. There's a dual dimension to this. God is faithful to his covenant, even when other people aren't. But also, even in their faithlessness, God's faithfulness is seen clearly. Or even in their sin and evil, God's character being maintained uh, abounds to his glory. This is the argumentation in Romans 9 through 11. It's if through Israel's rejection of the Messiah, salvation came to the Gentiles, what's going to happen when Israel accepts the Messiah? 
That's the idea of God working good through human evil. The Jews go, we don't want Messiah. So Jesus dies and brings salvation to the whole world so that through him being executed on the cross, salvation comes to humanity. And then salvation is brought to the Gentiles through the Jews' rejection of the gospel preached by the apostles. And so that's going to be one of the main ideas we'll see later on in Romans. But for now, know that yes, as, as, as hard as it is sometimes to believe, our God and his character and his truth and his ways abounds even more evidently and clearly. And his light is seen more gloriously, even through the darkness of the world. That doesn't mean God is glorified in sin. That means human evil plays a role in the part of the purpose God has within human evil and how he uses it is that he actually maintains his character and goodness and glory in the midst of all of it. So you see more clearly how awesome he is when you see how dark the world is. His light is just brighter, uh, almost in the sense the darker the world is. But it's on us to bring his light into the world so that more people experience his light. And in that sense, he's glorified. So let me know your thoughts in the comments and what you think about this idea that Paul is working with. Now, again, this isn't Paul, you know, saying, I don't believe God works good through human. He's, he's working with that as an established fact. But the conclusion he comes to is different than his adversaries come to. They say, well, just sin. Or why is God condemning us? He's unjust. And Paul's going, no. In fact, Romans chapter six will make this very clear. Should we sin so that grace may abound? all the more? No, that is not, that's not the right way to treat his grace. So we'll see in the next Bible study walk through how all this plays out. But for now, let me know your thoughts in the comments and we'll continue this idea in the next one. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do that and hit the bell so you can be notified of any future videos that come out. And check out AboveReproachMinistry.com. We have completely free Bible study courses, a 40-day program, a 27-day and 11-day program, all kinds of free resources. You can get a copy of my book. You can join our online church. You can get some merch. We have a bunch of stuff at AboveReproachMinistry.com. And it's also linked in the description below. Go check that out. And thanks for watching.